Hey everybody, I'm Kristen Hostetter. Welcome to another episode of Straight Talk. We're recording this on Earth Day 2021, and we have a very special guest with us today, Michael Galobter. Hi, Michael, how are you? Hi, Kristen, it's great to see you and to be here. Yeah, it's good to see you too. Um, correct me if I've got any of this info wrong, but Michael is one of our country's pioneers when it comes to carbon footprinting. He's been doing this work for almost two decades, long before it was in vogue to do so. Um, and that's why he brings a unique perspective to a very complicated process. In 2020, he launched his company Cooler, which is a technology-based solution to helping companies achieve their climate commitments. Did I get that right, Michael? Yeah, absolutely. We actually try to help companies make more money by fighting climate change. Very good point. Very good point. All right. So first question, tell us how you got into this work. How did you come to it? <laughs> well, I'm a little bit of an odd bird in the sense that I've always known what I wanted to do with my life, which was to work on social justice. And somewhere in my early 20s, I figured out that environment was the place I would do that and was blessed to work in the early days of the environmental justice movement and the climate justice movement. Um, and then I really, in about 2006, I ran an organization that really was successfully got a big climate law passed in California and in 14 Northeastern states. Uh, and I said to myself, okay, that's as far as we're going to get for a while. What else can we do? And I said, well, I think people change the world in two ways. They vote and they shop. And voting, as we've all found out, is very important, but very slow for achieving change. Uh, and so I started exploring ways to make shopping part of the solution to global warming. Well, that's a great segue into Cooler, right? So tell us about cool Cooler and how it works and why it's unique. Well, what Cooler does is it delivers the carbon footprint of any product or service that you buy anywhere in the world. And we do that almost instantly using software. And then we get companies to use that technology to sh either join their consumers or on their own, neutralize the footprint of that product. And they do that really in two ways. One, they don't use offsets. We actually they actually take a share of what they sell or they ask consumers to join them if the margins are small in their business. Um, they ask consumers to opt in and they buy, we actually help them buy permits away from polluters. We go to markets where polluters are already regulated, where they're already buying emissions permits to emit. And we squeeze the cap by using consumer dollars against those polluters and buying permits and retiring them. Uh, and the second way is we give the, same, the companies the footprint of their products and what they can go up, how they can go up their supply chain. So instead of taking years to figure out where the carbon comes from, we tell them pretty clearly where it's coming from up front. They can take action on neutralization up front. And all of our customers also then start going up their supply chain to drive carbon out of it. You know, I mean, we're seeing this a lot in the news, right? We report on it in Outside Business Journal all the time. So many companies are now, you know, publishing carbon neutrality goals. We're going to be carbon neutral by 2025 or 2030. What's the biggest lever that they can pull in order to get there, you know, in an authentic way? Yeah, well, it really depends. I, I would say there are two big categories. There are companies that are direct emitters of large amounts of CO2, like uh, gasoline companies, coal, fire, coal companies, cement companies, and companies that make equipment like buses and trucks and cars that emit a lot of CO2. Those people have to just wean themselves from fossil fuels, right? General Motors is saying all their vehicles are going to be electric by 2030. Great step. China's saying all the vehicles they're going to sell are electric. So basically, there are direct emitters. And then there's everybody else. And the direct emitters are really diverse. They're all trying to do, many are trying to do something, but many are hiding out, trying to avoid regulation. The reality is, though, that a lot of consumer facing companies and a lot of companies we're most familiar with, whether it's General Mills or or, you know, um, Microsoft, they're never really going to be regulated for carbon. They aren't directly big emitters. Their emissions comes from the fact that they depend on other people, power companies, for example, to sell them energy that might be clean or not. So for, for those companies, there are really two ways they can flex. The first is by lobbying and by being politically active, and many of them are now doing that. And the second one is by taking action um, to engage their consumers and to engage their community to drive more renewable energy into the grid. And that's really where our technology comes into play. And that, that applies a, a lot to outdoor companies, which is, of course, who we're mm -hmm. focused on too, right? I mean, we're seeing so many companies, you know, push their consumers. Patagonia is famous for it to get involved in policy and yeah. Um, and drive change um, through through their platforms, right? And, 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 you know, and the reality is, you know, people only get to go to the voting booth at most once a year, um, maybe in a year where there's a primary twice a year, you know, but um, they shop every day. And believe me, the more we can have that preference by consumers show up in the day-to-day -day shopping, 
legislators and policymakers and polluters are going to hear that and they're going to go, oh, shit. Because at the end of the day, all of us individually are willing to pay a lot more to stop global warming than a fossil fuel company. They make their money off global warming, right? So if we right. kick a few cents of our money towards, towards, towards stopping them, that has huge leverage. And when they see that coming, they're going to act faster also. Okay, so when we're talking about outdoor brands in general, the mm -hmm. gamut of outdoor brands, what are the top you know, three to five contributors to their carbon footprints? Yeah. Specifically. Well, so, you know, I would say one of the things that's happened is reuse, um, right? I, I don't know if you remember when, you know, a lot of outdoor companies, I won't name any specific ones, but had legendary lifetime warranties that all of us backpackers abused mercilessly, like, oh, my Sierra Designs pack has a rip. Okay, we'll fix it. Those are a little less common than they used to be. But, you know, companies like Trove, for example, that's working with REI and Patagonia are, are engendering reuse. If you can buy a Patagonia fleece for 30% less, and it's basically just as good as new because they never break, right? Um, that, that And it's recertified by a great company like Trove. That's a huge impact. So not making something, right, um, is very valuable. Reuse is the number one thing we can do. And, you know, the second one is to um, is just the materials and the production systems and everything else. And that's really where, where Cooler comes in is we help them understand that. Uh, we help them take action first. Thinking about end of use, making your product so they in fact can be remanufactured and reused as Nike has done for some shoes and other things like that. Um, and then going up your supply chain and greening it. The most single most important thing a company can do is make sure that everybody in their supply chain is using as much renewable energy as possible. Yeah, for sure. You know, we're hearing and reading um, and learning a lot about companies that are planting trees as a way to offset their carbon. Um, but you believe there's a better way than tree planting, right? Yeah, absolutely. Look, tree planting is great. Um, it's good for the planet. Um, it does not really stop uh, global warming in any way, shape, or form. you got to look at things that are creating social institutions that create like 100 years of certainty, um, meaning oftentimes people are attaching revenue flows, income flows to local communities in the tropics um, and other places that ensure that those communities will protect and not cut down those forests, that they have alternative means of livelihood and, and things that will guarantee that land encroachment doesn't take those forests out. But even 100 years is not enough. The half-life of CO2 in the atmosphere is somewhere between three and 500 years. So, you know, there's no way we can guarantee a tree is going to stand for 100 years. By planting trees, you can try to create a pulse that pulls a little bit more out right now to give us more time to reduce CO2, but that's the best you can hope for. Um, there are alternative ways we think that are far more secure. So what's the solution? What's the alternative to tree planting? Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. There's a whole field around what's called carbon removal. We do almost the most, the most immediate form of removal possible. We do not use offsets in our neutralization. Companies that work with us use our calculation. We use our calculation, and then we go buy an equivalent amount of permits away from polluters. Um, we literally go into the same markets that are every, that are their auctions every quarter in California, in for, in Quebec, in 14 northeastern states, and in European markets as well. We have qualified ourselves as if we were a smokestack. We say, hey, we want to buy some permits too because our consumers, our companies that serve consumers, are want to take care of their emissions, um, and we buy those permits and we retire them, which makes it which lowers the boom on all the polluters in that region. And actually, in that very quarter, they can reduce less. They can emit less because we've reduced the amount of permits available to them. Plus, the money then gets recycled by the states and by the governments into investments in mass transit and renewables um, and generates jobs. So we think of that as the most immediate way to go. There are some other newer experimental things that are coming online, but you can take a lot of action today that way. You know, when you and I have talked in the past, you've um, you've introduced this uh, interesting concept to me, and I, I want to give you a chance to talk about it. Um, additionality, yes, and how that how that factors into um, offsets and yeah. neutralizing carbon. Can you explain what additionality is? So there's another whole other category of offsetting involving technological interventions of various sorts. Like let's say that the outdoor industry were to pool some resources and build a lot of solar energy in Vietnam or in Taiwan or other places they make a lot of goods and services. That would reduce their footprint. Absolutely. It would not be a good offset because both of those countries are signatories to an international treaty that says they're already going to build more renewables. So you're accelerating that action, but it's not considered additional. It is a contribution to speeding that achievement. It's a great thing, but it's not considered an offset. That's kind of why trees still count because they're not part of the regulatory roadmap. 
Um, but of course, they're not as permanent as we'd like either. Right. Good. Uh, I know you're really interested in climate justice and social justice. And so so I want to turn to that for a little bit. What actions do you think we can take to, to welcome more people, particularly people from marginalized communities yeah. who bear the biggest brunt of climate impact um, yeah. into the climate movement? What actions can we take to do that? Yeah. Interestingly enough, they're already in the climate movement in a, the, probably the single most important way, and that's as voters. Um, there isn't a state, a local legislator, a state legislator, or a national federal legislator who votes for climate policy whose margin of victory isn't based on voters of color. Uh, if you are a representing an all-white district, the odds are very high that you are voting against climate policy, no matter where you are. So part of it is that the philanthropic community hasn't really recognized that. And there's been so little resource, only 1% of all climate philanthropy has gone to communities of color, despite the fact that they're really the voters of record on this issue at a policy level. We're lucky at Cooler, I'm, I'm kind of feeling really blessed because about a third of our customers are in the Southeastern United States, a group called Black Black Folks Camp 2, Beyond the Bayou. We're, I'm actually kind of stunned that our that we are so geographically balanced. As a matter of fact, the Southeast is overrepresented in our customer base, which is really exciting. The outdoor industry faces a particular different set of challenges, which is, you, you know, is sort of the, the groups like Outdoor Afro and others work on, which is how do you get more participation by communities of color in the outdoors? So, Michael, w- w- where do you see the intersection between communities of color and climate advocacy or climate change? People of color in general have been part of the outdoors in the United States forever, from Native communities to Latino communities to African-American communities. Unfortunately, kind of like almost like the Civil War Memorial problem, the national park systems, for example, the first state park system in New York State was built by Robert Moses, who explicitly built the bridges um, too low for public buses to go under so that you couldn't take a public bus to a state park. So there was a lot of racism starting in the 1850s and 1860s built into access to nature. Um, And I, I've experienced it personally as a backpacker. I've had, um, I've actually had people warn me when my, I took my infants backpacking that at high altitude, you wouldn't be able to see hypoxia because they were too dark to see them turning purple. If you could believe that, you know, so there is a fear and, and, and frankly, even civil rights movements, a lot of the churches in the Northeast used to go to parks on Sundays after church. That's where they would protest as they say, guess what? We're in a park. It's Sunday. And they'd be chased out by racists in the Northeast and Detroit. That's how a lot of black mayors got elected initially off off of those organizing struggles. So the outdoor industry is, um, I think, taking steps to uh, address that, both in the diversity of its advertising and its outreach. We just have to be aware that we all belong there um, and we have to do what we can. You have to stand up as an ally um, to fight for that sometimes as well. Yeah, absolutely. I couldn't agree more. Okay, last question. A lot of people believe that their personal actions, their personal day-to-day actions, like rejecting that plastic bottle or not taking that straw or, you know, that coffee cup don't have an impact on climate change or climate mitigation. Are they right? No, not at all. I mean, I think, I think, first of all, the most important thing I've seen is just the modeling in my own life with my own kids and with people around me. Um, I'm not a saint by any means. Um, But, you know, like my sons will not take plastic straws at all anymore, anywhere. Um, And, you know, and and that's great. You know, I mean, I think that's because it not only reflects a direct impact in terms of the reduction in plastics, but a mindset that that companies and manufacturers have to think about and start start to serve. The reality is there are higher leverage things to do than rejecting straws. um, And they ask me about that all the time. I mean, you know, what we're, what we're about at Cooler, for example, is taking some of your money or getting manufacturers to take some of the money they make from you and pitting it directly against polluters, using it to directly squeeze emissions out of the atmosphere. That's a very high leverage intervention. There are others out there. Um, I would say look at the stories behind the actions you're trying to take and look for the ones that, that you link your personal action to a political outcome. So even if it feels meaningless to reject a plastic bag, in a certain geography, it can make a huge difference in getting an ordinance passed so that those bags take, get taken off the market entirely. Um, so look for high leverage, things that tie your individual action to things that really put the screws to the worst of the polluters. And I think that's where the real opportunity is. Well, Michael, sure. it's been it's been really great talking with you. Thank, thank you for all those insights. Um, I learned a lot here and uh, I hope we can talk again soon. For sure. It's always, it's been such great working with you over the last decade and in this new position. It's awesome. Let's keep communicating and keep driving change. Thank you. For sure. 
And thank you everybody for watching this episode of Straight Talk. We've got lots more episodes you can check out at outsidebusinessjournal.com.